Tonight as we begin, I want to just uh, show some of the things that we'll be using so that you have an understanding of what, what this, uh, how we arrive at the conclusions and the topics that we have. Is if we were doing a commercial, this is a Strong's Concordance. And uh, we'll be using Strong Concordance. Huh? Oh, turn this around, okay. <laughs> we'll be using the Strong's Concordance. Um, Strong's Concordance is, is the standard for a dictionary for every word that has every single word that's in the Bible. Strong's uh, Concordance was written in uh, uh, the 1800s, but it has been updated and, and revised and remains since the 1800s still the standard. When someone wants to find out what a particular word in the Bible means, or if you want to know what it was in the original language, uh, it's Strong's Concordance that you look at, that any Bible scholar wants to find something out. And Strong's has numbered every single word in the Bible. So that if you looked up love, for instance, and you looked up the word love in the New Testament, and you wanted to uh, find out what God's love was, and we were looking it up in Greek, that number would be 26. And that's the word agape. You would look, it would say love in English, then it would say 26, and then you would look in the back where the dictionary is, and you'd see 26. You'd look up 26, and you'd see it's the word agape, or the verb agapeo. And then it would tell you what that word in Greek means. And so I'm going to make a lot of references through this study to Strong's Concordance and to the number in Strong's. And of course, in our church, we always have this Strong's Concordance available in the, um, in the library right here in the back room, which is accessible to anyone here. And so if I make reference to a number and you want to look that number up at some future date, be, uh, just feel free to do that. But that's what I'll be making reference to. I'll keep saying, in Strong's, it's number so-and-so. In Strong's, it's number so-and-so. And you need to know that. Strong's Concordance was uh, uh, written in conjunction with the wording that's utilized in the King James Bible. So if you wanted to look up a word uh, in the Bible that's in a particular sentence, uh, but you had only NIV, you would have to look that same passage up in, uh, in King James in order to see what the word is in Hebrew or the word is in Greek because Strong's written in the 1890s uh, is in conjunction with King James. So we'll be using King James version of the Bible as we go through this study. Uh, not that it's, uh, you know, we're negating any other particular version, but that's the way that we're able to code and find the actual Greek word or the Hebrew word that's being discussed in any particular topic. So I want to say tonight uh, that in an age when people are dying of AIDS and that they have need of love and compassion, the church or a lot of people that call themselves the church have gotten themselves caught in a web of legalism that brings judgment on itself and keeps people in bondage. Rather than helping people discover the Savior, the church is alienating people and perishing uh, and pushing the lost and the dying world further away. The church is not called to be the judge of the world. The church has been given the ministry of reconciling the world to God. And so um, several scriptures that we look at when we think about the role of the church and our introduction here is 2 Corinthians 3.17. That tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, not bondage. So the Spirit of the Lord doesn't bring us into bondage, it brings us into liberty. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. King James adds, To those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. So the gospel is good news. It brings liberation. It doesn't bring bondage. So if we're really listening to the gospel and we're paying attention to the good news of Jesus Christ, it's going to set us free. It's going to bring us joy. It's going to bring us peace. It's going to bring an increase of love. It's not going to bring uh, hatred and, and a lot of other things along with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says that the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life, and we are made able ministers of the Spirit. We're made to be ministers of the Holy Spirit, not lawgivers. We're not supposed to be pointing our finger at people and making laws and rules for them to follow because we think these are the rules they need to follow. But we're, because the letter of the law does that. You know, well, it says this in Leviticus 20, you better do this and, you know, 
or all you're all going to hell. Well, that's not the way the gospel's ever been presented and it works. Second Corinthians 3, 7 says uh, basically that the uh, ministry of bringing rules or the letter of the law engraved on stones is the ministry of death. So bringing rules and regulations, you better have this behavior, you better have that behavior, uh, misses the point because the Lord wants to bring us into liberty, not license, but liberty. And uh, there's a difference. So God has given us as the church the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of alienation. And I want to make that clear to begin with. And it also tells us in Matthew 15, 6, that the tradition of men, and that's what we'll be seeing a lot of times tonight, the tradition of men makes the word of God of none effect. In other words, if you bring people your tradition, what you think the word means, and it's not really what the word means, it has no effect on the listener. And uh, so it doesn't bring any liberty, it doesn't bring any, any uh, rejoicing, it doesn't bring any good news, because John 8:32 says that the truth sets people free. The tradition has never set anybody free, it just brings them under bondage and into legalism. Um, we know that, uh, for instance, the truth sets people free, and tradition doesn't. Years ago, in the last century, uh, and into the century before that, slave owners in America used to assemble the uh, church for their slaves. And when they did, the slave owners would provide the preacher. And the preacher always had the same text, and that was that slaves were supposed to be subject to their masters. And that was the text that they would always preach on week after week after week. But after the preacher left, that never brought any liberty to any slaves and it never gave them any hope or any, any uh, reason to follow Christ. But after the preacher left, then the slaves would really have church. And they'd worship God and that's where we got a lot of the spirituals that the church enjoys so much today. And uh, it was their prayers that I believe brought about the civil war that brought about freedom their prayers. So it wasn't that preaching that brought bondage, you see. Um, uh, women were always told that women aren't allowed to preach, they're not allowed to say anything in church because they brought about uh, a, a misinterpretation of the word that said a woman's not allowed to speak in the church. And uh, by bringing that particular form of bondage, it didn't bring liberty to anybody, especially someone anointed and called to preach the word, it brought bondage. In fact, uh, someone who was highly anointed of the Lord in the last century and into this century, Maria Wadsworth Etter, uh, did not fulfill her call in the beginning of her life because she always said, well, how can I? I'm not a man. And so it wasn't until her husband died, her children died, uh, and that she was left alone in life that then she said, well, I guess I've got nothing else to do but follow God. And then she began to preach and 20,000 people at a time would come to her tent meetings and people would just be uh, slain in the spirit and would be saved and uh, filled with the spirit. All healings of miracles would take place in her meetings. And uh, so the tradition of man was making the word of God of none effect. But as soon as she received the truth of the word and the truth set her free, it set thousands free. So, um, we, we see that uh, if it hadn't been the Spirit of God uh, bringing forth the truth of the Word, we would have missed out on Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, Maria Wadsworth Etter. We would have missed out on thousands of people that the Lord has brought to the church to edify the body of Christ. And uh, so it's not like the issue that we're looking at tonight is the first time the church ever thought of keeping people in bondage. That's the point. So it's not the first time. It's not the first time that some particular scripture that has been used by the tradition of men to keep people in bondage uh, has been challenged and been challenged as the Spirit brought about revelation. We know that we're in the last days and the Word says that in the last days knowledge will increase. And we know from John 3.16 that God loves people. And God's not in a box. God's not just loving certain kinds of people or, you know, certain people that fit certain criteria. God loves the world. The world is in rebellion against God, hates God, shakes their fist in God's face, and God loves them. And so, you know, people who try to say, well, God don't love those kind of people, don't know anything about what the Bible is talking about or anything about God because he loves people. That's what God, John 3.16 says. He so loves the world that he gave to the world, not to this church, to the world. And it says that uh, John 
12 to 47 says, Jesus did not come to judge, but to save the world. And uh, so, yet you've heard people say, well, AIDS is God's judgment on certain communities. And that's God's, you've heard people say that though. That, you know, that's God's judgment. And, uh, but the Bible says Jesus did not come to judge. He didn't come to bring AIDS. Uh, he came to save the world. And the world, the word for save is the word for heal. So if he came to heal the world, he'd be inconsistent and rather schizophrenic if he came to heal and at the same time judge with AIDS. There'd be a real problem there with the word because the word says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So uh, AIDS is not a judgment, it's a disease. And God didn't bring AIDS because he doesn't have AIDS. He can't give you something he doesn't have. There isn't any AIDS in heaven. And he told us to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth as it's being done in heaven. If he was bringing AIDS as a judgment, then you'd have to expect to find AIDS as a judgment in heaven. But it's not there. And so the things that God has to bring uh, are going to be good things, good gifts, liberty, bringing joy, bringing uh, rejoicing, bringing hope. Those are the things that God brings. So when we look at a topic like homosexuality, we have to ask these questions. Where did these traditions come from? Number two, we have to ask, do they have any validity? And number three, we have to ask, what does the Word of God really say? So as we begin tonight to look into uh, the various aspects of the Word of God, we'll identify and look into those traditions. So let's turn now to the Word of God.